Hi, everyone. Um, I wanted to make sure that this was publicly available because um, many of you expressed interest in hearing a recording or viewing my presentation that I gave to my global theology class recently. Um, I gave a lecture on James Cone and Black theology and the meaning of Black power and James Cone's theological pedagogy. And I wanted to make sure that it was publicly accessible to everyone so that everybody was able to look at it um, and hopefully engage with the material and engage with it well. This is your first time, you know, uh, learning about Black liberation theology, learning about James Cone. Um, I highly encourage you to read some of his books. Um, and, you know, this is not an exhaustive lecture, but it is a good introduction, I think, to Cone's work. So why don't I get this shared? I'm still learning how to do this. Okay, there we are. Okay, I'm such a boomer when it comes to technology. Okay, so this is Black Liberation Theology, James Cone's Pedagogy, and Black Power. Okay, so to provide a rough outline of African American history, because history is essential to understanding uh, Cone, to understanding where Black theology comes from. So this is just a brief timeline. In 1619, we have the first shipment of enslaved Africans brought to the United States. It's not the United States at that time, right? This is 100 or so years. This is over 100 years before the beginning of the American Revolution, before the um, beginning of the United States as we know it, but 1619 is the first shipment of enslaved Africans. They're brought um, to Virginia. Uh, in 1776, you can flash forward, the institution of slavery is fully ingrained uh, into colonial America. Um, cotton, uh, cotton is not yet king, but it's getting there. Um, you have most enslaved Africans working on rice, sugar plantations, tobacco plantations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it, it is a driving force behind the agrarian economy. In 1776, you have the American Revolution. Uh, thousands of enslaved Africans uh, fight uh, for both sides of that revolution, both the British side and the Patriot side. Um, both sides uh, actually make a promise that all people who enlist, all enslaved people who enlist in the armies will be freed. Um, so that's so 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 that's a driving motivator behind a lot of uh, African American veterans in that war. You flash forward about a decade, and you get the U.S. Constitution, which is ratified. The American Revolution is now done. America is free from England, uh, and the Constitution, the Constitutional Convention in 1787, is very contentious. Slavery is a contentious issue even then. Um, and you end up with a compromise, a compromise to deal with this contentious with this contentious issue, you know, Northern delegates and Southern delegates fighting about congressional representation. And they end up with a three-fifths compromise. That is that Africans will be counted as three-fifths people, uh, three-fifths of a person when accounting for census and congressional representation. Um, it's a way to ensure that Southern delegates uh, get uh, a large share of congressional representation. Um, so that's the three-fifths compromise. It will have major effects on how U.S. law views African Americans in subsequent decades. Flash forward um, a couple decades or several decades, and you get the Fugitive Slave Act, which was signed into law by President Millard Fillmore. Um, now, Agent 57, now that might actually be incorrect on my part, because I recall that the Fugitive Slave Act is passed several years earlier. In 1857, the president was James Buchanan, not Millard Fillmore, so you'll forgive me for that mistake. But the Fugitive Slave Act in the 1850s is really significant because it gives the federal government actually grants permission for uh, slave owners to go out uh, and capture enslaved people once they're already in free territory. It's a pretty significant turning point as the nation gets closer and closer to civil war on the issue of slavery. 1860, you have the election of Abraham Lincoln. Remember, Abraham Lincoln is not an abolitionist. He is against slavery expansion in the westward territories. We have the Civil War. Civil War ends in 1865, slavery is abolished, and then you have 12 years of sort of Camelot, 
Reconstruction, I hesitate to call it Camelot because you also have the growth of white supremacist organizations like the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, honestly, we're going really, really fast. So forgive me for that. This is a just a overview of history. We have Reconstruction for 10 to 12 years. You have African-Americans serving in Congress. African-Americans are allowed to vote. They are full citizens, very briefly. But in 1876, with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes, you have the Great Compromise, where Rutherford B. Hayes and the Republican Party, which traditionally supported uh, civil rights and an end to slavery, uh, switches to a much more uh, laid back, uh, much more lethargic position. And they, they, they announce that reconstruction is effectively over. So no longer will the federal government protect the civil rights of African Americans. So between 1877 and 1964, you have Jim Crow, Black Codes, Plessy v. Ferguson, separate but equal. Uh, and these are the enshrining of white supremacy into the laws of the land post-slavery. So we're looking at several centuries here where African-Americans have not been in a position for any sustained long period of time where they have had the full protections of American citizens. And between 1877 and 1964, you have Jim Crow uh, and you have the civil rights movement. You have African-Americans resisting white supremacy. So 1965 to uh, uh, is the voting rights campaign. 1964, you have the signing of the Civil Rights Act by President Lyndon Johnson. In 65, you have the Selma to Montgomery March led by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference uh, and other black uh, and white uh, clergy. Uh, to organize for the right to vote. That is also a very significant point in history. And then from 1965 to 2014, right, we have the death of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the murder of him in 1968, um, the assassination of Malcolm X in early 1965. But from 65 to 2014, you kind of have this post-civil rights era. What does America look like after segregation, after Jim Crow, uh, and after uh, sort of state-sponsored explicit segregation? And you end up with a lot of contentious battles over busing, housing, desegregation, school desegregation, years and years and years after these issues were supposedly resolved in the courts. So post-civil rights era brings forth its own uh, significant challenges to the black community, um, not just in terms of desegregation, but also in terms of inequity in healthcare, education, and employment. You have a significant shift toward mass incarceration. The war on drugs is a big thing we have in the post-civil rights era. Um, so yeah, it's the enduring legacy of Jim Crow, even if Jim Crow is out of the law or off the, off the laws. Okay. In 2008, you have the election of Barack Obama. That's a pretty big significant event for obvious reasons. And in 2014 to present day, you have the Black Lives Matter movement. This has been called by many sort of a new kind of civil rights movement. Okay. So in order to understand Cone's theology, you have to understand, uh, the late great, Reverend Dr. James Cone himself. So he was born in Fordyce, Arkansas in 1938. He spends most of his uh, childhood in Bearden, Arkansas, uh, where he attended Macedonia AME Church. Uh, Bearden is significant in Cone's theology. Uh, it's Cone's uh, contextualization of self, um, as I would call it. It's him putting himself uh, in history and analyzing theology through, through the lens of which he was born and raised. And growing up in segregated Bearden, Arkansas is a significant, uh, significant form, formation period for him. And uh, he's ordained in the African Methodist Episcopal Church in his 30s. Um, he, and, and what's important about the AME before I move on is that the AME is the oldest black denomination in the United States. It's the first one and it's the oldest one. And that is significant uh, because Cone uh, uh, looks at theology through the lens of someone who's born in segregated South and someone ordained in the largest and oldest black denomination. He's very, very uh, ingrained in black ecclesiology. Okay, he, he then goes on to teach at Adrian College at the time of Revelation. What I mean by that is he describes it as a powerful prophetic revelation in 1969 after the death of Martin Luther King Jr. after the assassination, after the riots that took place, he experienced a, 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 a supernatural uh, revelation from God as he called it. You know, he, he, he said, you know, I could hear the cries of black blood 
crying out to God for liberation. That's obviously in reference to Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis, when Cain kills his brother Abel and Abel's blood cries out to God. He said he could hear it, the blood of the enslaved, the blood of blacks suffering in America under white supremacy. Um, he could hear it as a professor at Adrian College. And that propels him to write his first book, Black Theology and Black Power, which is published in 1969. Um, after that publication and after subsequent books, Black Theology of Liberation, God of the Oppressed, he is called the father of Black liberation theology. Cohn himself did not like that title. He would always say that Black theology is not something he made up. It's not something he invented. He says this is a theology that comes from slaves. Right, that comes from African Americans in their collective experience of racism and white supremacy in the United States. It is not his own personal invention. However, that is typically how we view things in capitalist America. We, we have a very individualistic lens on the leaders of social movements and uh, uh, intellectual movements and come, unfortunately, to his chagrin is the recipient of that. When he, so he goes on to teach at Union in the early 1970s. He ends up holding the distinguished Charles A. Briggs Systemic Theology Professorship there. Uh, Union Theological Seminary is known as being a seminary for Christian social justice. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr taught there for many years, another uh, uh, influence of Cohn, although Cohn critiques Reinhold Niebuhr pretty aggressively in his, in his final book. But yeah, Cohn teaches at Union. That's where his legacy is imprinted. Uh, you have a lot of students uh, former students at Union now who are ordained ministers and professors who had Cone in their classes, and um, all of them say he was a dedicated professor, he was a kind and caring professor, but he was fierce and serious about his theology. Okay, and throughout this time, throughout most of Cone's life, as he's teaching at Union, he publishes several other books, as I mentioned before, God of the Oppressed, A Black Theology of Liberation, uh, and The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Uh, he, pe oh, sorry about that. He passed away in 2018 uh, uh, at the age of 79 of cancer. 2018, excuse me, did I say 2019? Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, there's a video of Cohen. I'm not gonna show it here for copyright purposes. We can move on. I'll probably, I'll link the, what I'll do is I'll link the uh, YouTube link um, in the uh, Facebook post when this eventually goes up on Facebook. Okay, so liberative theological pedagogy. So pedagogy basically is just an outline of how you do education, how a school of thought does its work. Um, and the sort of ethos that it forms um, patterns and, sisters and systems of thinking, excuse me. So in liberation theology, the oppressed are centered. They are the center of liberation theology because the oppressed are thought to have a special kind of relationship with God that those in positions of dominance and power do not have. Uh, the oppressed uh, are those who do the exegeting, right? As I say here, scripture and hermeneutics are shaped by oppressed people and their lived experience. And this goes for any oppressed group of people. This can apply to blacks in America. This, this can apply to Jews in Nazi Germany. This can apply to indigenous people around the world. This can apply to, 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 to women, to LGBTQ people, to uh, colonized groups around the world. The oppressed and their experience of dominance by another group, by the state and by systems and patterns mainly formed by white supremacy, capitalism and imperialism, their experience is at the core. And the reason why is because Jesus in liberation theology is the oppressed one. Jesus, God incarnate has come, is, 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 is God coming into the world as an oppressed person, as someone who also is a victim of colonialism and white supremacy and, and heterosexism Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that's really formative in liberation theology. It is a theology of oppressed people by oppressed people for oppressed people. Uh, and the last thing is power is counter Christian. In liberation theology, there is no coherent relationship between systems of power and dominance and Christianity. That is a contradiction of terms. Cohn says any theology, any theology that is not us. Uh, solidly committed that does not talk about this is that does not reflect on um the liberation of oppressed people is not christian theology uh power and dominance uh, are are antichrist 
Um, and we'll get into that in more detail in a moment. Okay, this was the first round of questions you can be thinking about. Um, this was for the class. We didn't get to we didn't get to all of them, but you can definitely pause and I'll let you all read those three questions or four questions, and then I'll move on. Okay, so now we get to specifically black liberation theology. And one of the biggest, biggest points of Cone's theology, I'd say this is the biggest, um, the biggest claim Cone makes is that God is actually black. Now, what does blackness mean in this context? What does, you know, what, what does God being black mean? Well, Cone separates, Cone takes the Trinity very seriously. And he describes each person of the Trinity as revealed as black in different ways. So God the Father is on the side of the oppressed. That's the biggest, that's the first claim he makes. I won't say it's the biggest claim, it's the first claim that he makes. So in an American context, it's blacks against white supremacy, right? God the Father is on the side of blacks as they resist, as they rebel, and as they organize against white supremacy in the black power movement, in the civil rights movement, and in, in, in now the Black Lives Matter movement. And where, does, and, and where does Cone get this idea that God the Father is in the side of the oppressed? He gets it from the Exodus, and he relates this, the, 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 the Exodus story, to contemporary America in a very powerful, powerful way. Exodus is the center of God the Father's liberating work on behalf of the oppressed Hebrew slaves, right? We remember the Exodus story as the story of Moses, you know, leading the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. Well, what can be more analogous to that than slavery in America? So in Cone's theology of the Father God, God has taken the side of Hebrew slaves and set them free, liberated them from their Egyptian oppressors. Uh, and God is doing the same thing uh, in contemporary America. God was doing the same thing uh, in the period of chattel slavery in America. God is on the side of blacks as they struggled, as we struggled against um, chattel slavery and against uh, the oppression of whites. So in addition to the Exodus story, right, the Exodus story is sort of the foundation of Judaism in a, in, in a very significant way. Abraham and Exodus are the two very huge significant events in Judaism that shape um, their view of God. Uh, and Cone takes the Old Testament seriously as well as the New Testament, right? He quotes the prophets, Micah 6, 8, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? You know, so Old Testament prophets continue this theme. The prophet Isaiah, the prophet Jeremiah continue this theme. It's back in Amos. Amos is a, a lovely prophet. He continues this theme um, of God being on the side of oppressed people, that God has exalted the meek and lowly, um, that God uh, that in God's kingdom, right, in the kingdom of God, uh, there, there, there is equity, there is justice, there is uh, liberation for all people oppressed in the earthly world. Okay, we transition to the New Testament. This is very significant. This is God the Son. This is Jesus Christ. And Christ is the liberator in Black liberation theology. Christ's message is radically political right? Cone's theology is material as well as spiritual, uh, but, it's, but it's heavily devoted to this material idea that Jesus Christ is Black. Jesus Christ has come into the world as Black, not literally Black, right? And I'll get to that in a minute, right? God, the Father, God, the Holy Spirit, God, the Son are not literally biologically, ethnically Black, but they are Black in the sense that they identify with oppressed people. So, well, God the Father is on the side of the oppressed, and that is God's identification. God the Son reveals himself as the incarnate God. Uh, Jesus Christ as God incarnate is the oppressed becoming flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, right, as the Gospel of John says. And Christ's message is political, right? He's preaching about this kingdom of God, this counter-revolutionary, this revolutionary kingdom, this counter-cultural kingdom. Uh, this kingdom that contradicts itself, that juxtaposes, that distinguishes itself from the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire is this oppressive regime. Uh, it is brutal. It is authoritarian. It uh, uh, is, is, is horrific to the Jewish people. Jesus Christ comes into the world as a Middle Eastern Jew under colonialism and preaches a gospel of liberation. Um, and that is what gets uh, Jesus killed. And we'll talk about the cross uh, and resurrection in Cone's theology as well. So God, so 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 Christ crucified, 
uh, are the lynched bodies of blacks in America. And again, we'll get to that later. This is Jesus' death on the cross and Cone's theology being used as analogy to black people being lynched in America. Cone draws it big significance. You know, the execution of Christ is a lynching, according to Cone. And Christ's resurrection is divine black power. The resurrection is the ultimate act of resistance to the empire because when the Roman empire put Jesus to death, they did not expect him to raise from the dead. And the fact that Christ rose from the dead, that he conquered and defeated the powers of death means that he also defeated the powers of empire. We know that Christianity spread rapidly after the ascension of Christ. And, and as the disciples and the apostles spread the word of God, spread the word of Christ, spread the gospel, um, we know the Roman Empire eventually collapsed uh, under Emperor Constantine and became Christian. Uh, I should say the Roman, the Roman Empire, as Jesus knew it, collapsed and became Christian under Emperor Constantine. Um, so Christ's resurrection is divine black power. It is God revealing that oppression does not have the final word. Death does not have the final word. Uh, and the empire's authoritarianism does not have the final word, but life has the final word. Liberation has the final word, okay? So we move on to God, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of resistance. The Holy Spirit is God's indwelling among the oppressed as they fight, as they struggle, right? Jesus uh, is God incarnate. God, the Father, uh, is the sustainer, the creator and sustainer. He has designed the oppressed in his image, and he takes their side. The Holy Spirit is the indwelling of God, right? It's not modalism, right? It's not these three, you know, are different modes of God, but they're three persons, one God manifest in different ways of liberation, in unique ways of liberation. The spirit, God's indwelling. God is present, according to Cohn, in the Black Power struggle. God is present on the Selma to Montgomery Bridge. God is present um, in slave revolts of Denmark, B.C. and Nat Turner. Uh, you know, God is present there. The spirit is moving, right? Remember Luke chapter four, the spirit has anointed me to deliver good news to the poor, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to liberate the oppressed, let, let the captives go free. The spirit has anointed me to do it, you know, as Jesus says. And that is where Cone draws his, 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 his pneumatology, right? His theology of the Holy Spirit. Um, the spirit is, 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 is on the picket line. Um, the spirit is, is, is in the black churches, right? Is in those organizing places. You know, God is not indifferent. God is not neutral. God has sided with the oppressed and he's with them. He's sustaining them. He's nurturing them and, and, and he is leading them. Okay. And all of these things, right. Point to God being black. So what does blackness mean in Cone's context? It does not mean biology. It's not biology. It's not, you know, Cohn would make that statement often. It's not a statement about biology. It is God's blackness is an identification statement, a theological statement. It's a theological imaginary way of saying that God has chosen to come into the world and God has chosen to reveal himself in the world as an oppressed person in the person of Christ, as uh, a spirit of liberation in the Holy Spirit as the creator uh, of oppressed people in, uh, uh, in God the Father, not as a creator of the systems of oppression, but as creating oppressed people in God's own image. The oppressed people bear the image of God. That is what Cone means uh, when he says God is black, is that if God is Jewish in a Jewish context, God is black in an American context, okay? If God is a Hebrew, uh, in the context of Roman occupation, then God must be black in a system of white supremacy in America. So these are a couple quotes on God from Cone. I want to read them for you. Jesus Christ is not a proposition, not a theological concept which exists merely in our heads. He is an event of liberation, a happening in the lives of oppressed people struggling for political freedom. Therefore, to know him is to encounter him in the history of the weak and the helpless. That is why it can rightly be said that there can be no knowledge of Jesus, right? Independent of the history and culture of the oppressed. It is impossible to interpret the scripture correctly and thus understand Jesus aright 
unless the interpretation is done in the light of the consciousness of the oppressed and their struggle for liberation, right? Again, what I said about the material nature of Christ's ministry. According to the Bible, the cross and resurrected of Jesus, the cross and resurrection of Jesus, excuse me, are God's decisive acts against injustice, against the humiliation and suffering of the little ones. Indeed, it is because God disclosed himself as the oppressed one in Jesus, that the oppressed now know that their suffering is not only wrong, but has been overcome. This new knowledge of God in Jesus grants the oppressed the freedom of fighting against the political structures of servitude, which make for pain and suffering. Again, the resurrection is this powerful experience. It is God saying no to oppression and yes to liberation. Okay, Jesus had little tolerance for the middle or upper class religious snob whose attitude attempted to usurp the, sover the sovereignty of God and destroy the dignity of the poor. The kingdom, remember the kingdom of God, is for the poor and not the rich because the former has nothing to expect from the world, while the latter's entire existence is grounded in his commitment to worldly things. The poor man may expect everything from God, while the rich man may expect nothing because he refuses to free himself from his own pride, right? And Cone draws on these things. He draws on the gospels when it says in the Magnificat, the prayer of the Virgin Mary. I know it's the feast day of the, of the visitation of the Virgin Mary today. When Mary says, God has exalted the weak and lowly, right? My spirit uh, rejoices in God, my savior. My soul magnifies the Lord. He has exalted the lowly. He has sent the rich away empty, right? So Cone is, 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 is putting God uh, in this position um, using scripture. Right, saying that scripture supports this stance that God has chosen the poor, He's exalted them, He's brought them to glory, and the rich because of worldly possessions. Uh, they are not the inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. Cone quotes the Beatitudes as well, but these are just three quotes that really illuminate where Cone is coming from. Okay, so his theology of the cross is, signif is, 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 is quite significant. I know I'm using that word quite a bit here, but every part of this. Uh, is important. I'd argue that Cone's theology of the cross is probably the second most important thing behind God being black. Okay, so what is his theology of the cross, right? The horrible event of the crucifixion in all four gospels, which is the center point, which is a huge center point in Christian theology. So according to Cone, the cross is a site of, of ultimate injustice. He's contradicting uh, the, the, the wide consensus in many white theological spaces, which he would accuse of romanticizing the cross. You know, white theology believes the cross is a beautiful example of God's love. It's amazing. It's great. It's lovely. And we get all euphoric and we love singing our songs and lifting our hands up about how wonderful the cross is. Not for Jim Cohn. The cross is the site of ultimate injustice. It is a horrible event, a brutal event of oppression. Um, and that's significant. Um, it is a paradox for Cohn, right? Uh, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. You know, the cross is God's is 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 God willingly giving Himself up to the punishment of empire. You know, so it's injustice. Jesus is tried at a kabuki court, a kangaroo court. You know, he's tried without evidence you know, with no evidence to prove his wrongdoing, and yet he's executed, given the ultimate punishment of death. So the cross is a lynching of a black man. I mean, think about the trials of lynchings across the South. If there was a trial, whites were rarely convicted for the crime, and they had to turn up almost no evidence, because all it took was an accusation to get a black man lynched, um, even if a black man was convicted, right? Even if you have a black man or a black woman, right, accused of say rape, for example, uh, and you have an all white jury that convicts this black man, even though the black man is convicted and likely facing a lifetime in prison, you still have whites all across the country taking it upon themselves, not just in the Jim Crow South, but in places like Ohio, upstate New York, taking it upon themselves to lynch anyway, right? There's something significant about this extrajudicial killing of black bodies. Uh, and Cohn says, that's the cross. That is the cross. Christ is killed extrajudiciously. Ex excuse me, extrajudicially. That's, <laughs> that's a complicated word. Christ is executed just like black men are lynched in America, right? It, 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 it bears powerful resemblance, right? Christ hangs on a tree. Black men hang on trees, right? Black people hang on trees. 
okay? The cross is state-sanctioned violence. Again, the empire put Christ to death, not the Jews, right? The Jews at the time had uh, no authority. The Jewish leaders, at least, had no authority to execute Jesus. You know, Jesus was a Jew. You know, Jesus' apostles were Jewish. Jesus' followers and disciples were Jews, right? It's not the Jews. It's not the oppressed community that executed Christ. It is the oppressors who executed Christ. And likewise, it is oppressors in America, right? State-sanctioned violence against Black bodies, you know, in the forms of lynching, chattel slavery, uh, the, the brutal separation of families, um, the mass killing of, 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 of Black uh, freedom strugglers, the Black Panthers, right? Cohen would say all of that is state-sanctioned violence. And now, you know, the police killings, the massive amounts of police brutality uh, in Black communities, you know, the, the, the murder of Eric Garner, Rakia Boyd, and Philando Castile, and George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor, and so many others, so many others. Um, just as the cross is state-sanctioned violence, uh, uh, the death of, of Blacks in America at the hands of white supremacy is state-sanctioned violence. The cross is God's paradox. It is God subverting this binary that we've, that, 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 that sort of the world expects of God. The world does not expect God to come into the world as oppressed, right? Jesus didn't come to the world in a mansion uh, with, with, with millions of wealth. Jesus did not come you know, to live an easy life. The cross is God's paradox because Jesus, as God's son, encounters the worst form of human suffering, the suffering Christ. He takes a lot from Maltman's uh, The Crucified God. You know, it's this paradoxia, paradoxia theologica, this paradox theology, uh, where, where God, you know, the almighty God, the, 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 the God worthy of all praise and glory, right? The God, the king of heaven, uh, has encountered the worst, the lowliest, the, the, the most humiliating form uh, of human punishment. Um, that is God's paradoxical love, that he, because of his love for the oppressed community, encounters the oppressed community in their worst moment and in their worst time. And that, that is huge. That is huge. That is the center of Christian theology, is God's revealing paradoxical love on the cross, okay? And the fifth point here is that the cross achieves solidarity atonement for the oppressed. That's Cone's theology of solidarity atonement, right? It's that God achieved atonement for, 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 for humankind because he acted in solidarity for the oppressed. And that is how people are saved, you know, in solidarity with the oppressed. Uh, that is atonement. That is salvation. That is the kingdom uh, uh, that is us being ushered into the kingdom as oppressed people, right? Is when you are is when you are poor like they are poor. Is when you suffer like they suffer, right? It's us as Christians taking on the oppressed condition as our own condition, uh, and that is what the cross achieves spiritually. You know, divine solidarity with oppressed community. Okay, this is really significant here. Remember, I mentioned the lynching tree analogy. This is going to come up. Uh, in this quote. The lynching tree is the most potent symbol of the trouble nobody knows that Blacks have seen but do not talk about because the pain of remembering, visions of Black bodies dangling from Southern trees surrounded by jeering white mobs is almost too excruciating to recall. In that era, the lynching tree joined the cross as the most emotionally charged symbols in the African-American community, symbols that represent both death and the promise of redemption judgment and the offer of mercy, suffering and the power of hope. Both the cross and the lynching tree represented the worst in human beings and at the same time, quote, an unquenchable ontological thirst for life that refuses to let the worst determine our final meaning. What a beautiful quote. And that is the center of what I meant when I said it's God's paradox. It's, it's death and redemption, justice and mercy, suffering and hope, right? That is where that, that's the cross. Okay, I'll let you all read the second round of questions. You can pause this video, you can think about them, you can write them down. <laughs> 
Okay. And now we get to the meaning of black power, right? What does black power mean? And black power is a complicated word in American discourse because it often uh, uh, gets a really negative connotation. But, but, but as you'll see here, the real meaning of black power uh, isn't really all that radical if you really think about it. It's only radical uh, in a uh, oppressive society uh, as we live in in the United States. So the meaning of black power, black power first and foremost is resistance, black resistance to white supremacy. It's black saying no to white supremacy, no to whiteness and yes to blackness. And as blacks say yes to, uh, to their own blackness, they celebrate that blackness, black identity, black religion, black culture, black spiritual practices, you know, black hair, black dress, black everything. Blackness is beautiful uh, in black power and it's black people reclaiming the beauty of blackness from what whites and what Europeans have decided blackness is. It is the collective action of blacks to dismantle white power dismantle white supremacy, overturn systems of injustice and claim themselves as liberated. You know, it's the rediscovery of black history and Afro centers and reconnecting with the roots in Africa that, that enslaved Africans were robbed of when, when, they, were, when, when they arrived in America uh, on slave ships. They, their names were taken, their cultures and identities were robbed of them so that, so that they might conform to whiteness and thus make better slaves for a white economy. And black power is the rediscovery of that painful history, but also celebrating, you know, connecting co connecting themselves to the mother continent uh, in a in a meaningful cultural way. It's black self determination, you know, black power for black people, all power to all people, as the Black Panthers used to say. You know, it's blacks determining the conditions of their own community. It's blacks determining how black people will interact with the world. Uh, they decide. You know, it's black agency, you know, and it's but 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 what it is not is significant as well as what it is. Uh, and with black power, it's not necessarily what it has uh, that 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 is only significant. Right. It's not what black power contains. It's what black power does not contain. And what black power does not contain uh, is black supremacy. It's not blacks dominating whites, but it is blacks saying we will not be denigrated and oppressed by whites, right? So justice by any means necessary. What does that mean? What does black resistance mean? What does it mean to say no to whiteness? It means justice by any means necessary. It's not nonviolent, right? As blacks encounter state sanctioned violence, violence from the state in the form of police brutality, in the form of pervasive inequality, in the, perform in, in the form of mob violence, right, as, as Blacks have gone through all of them, you know, it's Blacks saying we're going to rise up, take up arms and resist, you know, state sanctioned violence will not have the final word on our condition, you know, that's what I meant when I said that Christ's resurrection is divine Black power, that's what Cone means, you know, Black, uh, Christ's resurrection is justice by any means necessary to the point of conquering death itself, so that's, that is the meaning of Black power. Okay, this is the final round of questions. Okay. So this is just pictures of black theology and black power today. You see some clergy marching with the Black Lives Matter movement. I think black power is made manifest uh, in the activists and the poets and the writers, uh, in the public theologians and sociologists and uh, theorists, uh, and in these wonderful pockets of activism around the United States. That is where black power is. Uh, and it's coinciding with black theology, right? Uh, you know, you have black clergy uh, who are saying, you know, the gospel is black liberation. And even those who don't identify with religion uh, within the black community are still finding ways to celebrate black spiritual practice uh, as we face sort of the dual traumas of COVID-19 and the horrific, horrific amounts of death at the hands of racial inequality in healthcare, which we've experienced in COVID-19 and we face the trauma of black death at the hands of police and state violence, um, as well as just 
widespread white supremacy, as we saw the horrific, horrific killing uh, of blacks uh, in Buffalo, New York, um, a little over a few weeks ago. Okay, what does black theology mean for the Christian mission? Now that we have linked black power and Christian theology, what does it mean? What are Christians called to do as a light uh, and salt in the world? What, what is the meaning of Christian discipleship in black theology? So first and foremost, Christians are called to bear the cross of whiteness. What does Cone mean by whiteness, right? It's not Polishness, it's not Irishness. I have to say this when I talk about whiteness because I don't want my white friends to think that this is a personal attack. You know, none of this has anything to do with individuals. It's all about collective, uh, uh, collective action and collective systems of oppression, right? So what we mean by whiteness is we just simply mean white supremacy, the centering of white um, identity on every aspect of socioeconomic and political life, right? Whiteness is just another word for white supremacy, um, but it's also uh, a commentary on how white supremacy has influenced aspects of our culture at large. So Christians are called to bear the cross of whiteness. It means that we as Christians are called to say no to white supremacy, no to whiteness, right? We put that on the cross, we crucify it. Um, and we say yes to blackness. We say yes to the oppressed, right? Blackness is defined as the material condition of the oppressed. And we say yes to the marginalized, yes to oppressed people, okay? So the second calling is Christians must hate injustice. Saying yes to oppressed people means we hate injustice against oppressed people. We hate injustice. We're not passively against it. We're not saying racism is bad. Sexism and homophobia is bad you know, classism is bad. Yeah, that's all well and good, but Christians must hate it. They must loathe injustice. It must be considered an ultimate sin, right? A, car, a, 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 a mortal sin, as my Roman Catholic friends would say. Um, and because we hate injustice and because we bear the cross of whiteness, we are as the church, the site of revolution. We are as the church, the site of struggle. We are the place uh, both in a in a physical sense, right, church buildings, uh, but also in an ecclesial sense, a spiritual sense, we are the site of the revolution of oppressed people against oppression. You know, that is where oppressed people ought to feel most at home is in the church, because it is in the church as Christians in black theology, we are called to lock arms and join forces and fight, um, and fight to maintain and sustain equity, equity and liberation powers and structures of oppression must be confronted by the Christian witness, right? We are all Christian witnesses. We are all witnesses of Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came into the world as an oppressed person. And because of that, because we recognize the significance of what Christ did on the cross, what Christ did in the resurrection and the significance of Christ's ministry, we must confront the powers and structures of oppression that put him on that cross. We must confront it and we must overturn it the church is to have uh, an, an antithetical relationship with power. And the gospel, hermeneutics, how do we read scripture? How do we engage in spiritual practice? How do we, how do, we do this, right? How do we do this thing called Christian in our everyday spiritual lives? It means that when we read the gospel, when we read the Bible, when we encounter scripture, we read it in light of the worldwide struggle for liberation. What does that mean? It means that we read it from the margins. No longer do we read the gospel as some, you know, you know, a Hallmark movie channel, Christian boyfriend, you know, you know, you know, spiritual self-help book. We read the gospel from the position of what does the Christian gospel mean for a single mom in public housing in New York? What does the gospel mean for Eric Garner? What does the gospel mean for Sandra Bland? What does the gospel mean for Marsha P. Johnson, for Dominique Jackson, for, 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 uh, for Sylvia Rivera? You know, what does it mean for, for, for Harvey Milk? What does it mean for James Baldwin, right? What does it mean for oppressed people in the here and now as well as oppressed people in the past who resisted oppression? What does it mean for undocumented people? for LGBTQ people? What does it mean for women 
You know, what does it mean for working class people? What does it mean for those organizing union strikes? How do we read the gospel? How do we read scripture? How do we make scripture relevant to the condition of oppression in today's America, of the poor, of blacks, of women, of, of queer folk, of trans folk? How do we read it as relevant to them to give them the tools to resist the powers that are oppressing them as well? And there's another thing I want to say about the, the, the cross of whiteness. Whiteness, in Cone's way, is described as white supremacy, but it also is the calling of all Christians to bear the cross of whatever privileges and systems of power benefit them. So if you are white, the cross of whiteness is yours to bear. But if you are a black cis man like myself, the cross of patriarchy is mine to bear, right? If you're wealthy, the cross of wealth is yours to bear, right? It's the bearing of the cross in a manner that makes discipleship on behalf of those less fortunate all the more easier. I'm going to say that again. To bear the cross of your own privilege makes discipleship on behalf of the oppressed, on behalf of the poor, on behalf of the least of these, the least of these identified with Christ in the gospel, all the more easier. And I don't mean easy as in you're not going to face hardship. I don't mean easy as in, you know, it's a walk in the park. But easy as in it creates a consciousness, a format, a way of being, a way of looking, a, a, a perspective where you know what your mission is. And your mission is on behalf of those at the least of these, at the margins of society. Okay. If you want to know more about Cone and Black theology, like I said, this is a very loose very sort of rambly lecture here. This is not a, a, an, an, exhaustive, an exhaustive analysis of Cone by any means or of liberation theology by any means. Here are some recommended books. Black Theology and Black Power, God of the Oppressed, Black Theology of Liberation, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. Those are all Cone books. Those are excellent books. I love Miguel de la Torre. His Liberation Theology for Armchair Theologians is really, really good. Uh, theology of Liberation by Gustavo Gutierrez. He, he's one of the founders of liberation theology. Indecent Theology by Marcella Outhouse Reed. That's queer theology, uh, which is a critique of liberation theology as well as making liberation theology apply to LGBTQ people uh, as well. Okay, so I hope you all enjoyed this. Thank you all for looking. That was the open floor uh, slide I had for my lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please. Uh, message me or comment in the Facebook uh, 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 comment section. Um, questions are welcome. Comments are welcome. Suggestions, criticisms, anything. It's all welcome uh, in this space. Uh, and thank you. Um, and I appreciate you all for watching. You all be blessed.